Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today we ask the question, what does beer have to do with exoplanets? Well, if you've been paying attention to the news, you probably know. Trappist, yes. The Transiting Planets and Planetesimal Small Telescope, an acronym which was conceived by a bunch of Belgians, appropriately enough. That telescope in Chile observed a couple of transits uh, around a nearby star, and uh, they discovered a couple of exoplanets. Then, of course, they got their friends at NASA to follow up with the Spitzer Space Telescope, and it found a grand total of seven other transiting bodies. That makes this star, now christened TRAPPIST-1, the star with the most number of exoplanets around it. Moreover, it's worth noting that these exoplanets all have sizes which are comparable to the size of the Earth. And even more excitingly, a couple of them are at just the right distance to support liquid water on their surface. So the star TRAPPIST-1 is just about the smallest a star can be and still be a star. It is 0.08 solar masses and its luminosity is very, very low. And because the luminosity is so low, the planets have to orbit really close in to be uh, within the habitable zone. Now, if you look at this simulation in Universe Sandbox and I bring in Jupiter, you can actually see that the star is not much bigger than Jupiter, at least in terms of radius. It is about 80 times more massive. The difference, of course, between Jupiter and this star is that the star is so much more massive that it is able to begin hydrogen fusion in its core and therefore get very hot and provide enough luminosity to its planets that they can be a star system in and of itself. The star's surface temperature is only about 2500 Kelvin. That's about half the temperature of the surface of the Sun. And the total luminosity is about 1 2,000th of the luminosity of the Sun. But because it's so red, a lot more of its energy is coming out in the form of infrared radiation that we can't see. So if you were standing on a nice temperate planet, perhaps, looking up at the star, it would seem, in terms of brightness, to be about the same as dusk on Earth. But it would feel as warm as midday, because the visual light you would be seeing would be about 200 times weaker than the amount of infrared radiation coming down from the star. And of course, standing on the surface of one of these planets, you would be able to see almost all the other planets in the star system easily. You would possibly even see them transiting the sun. At the right place and time, you might be able to see neighboring planets as big as we would see the moon on Earth. But you'd have to travel to the right viewing locations because these are so close to their parent star that they are almost guaranteed to be tidally locked unless they themselves have moons of their own. But the tidal locking doesn't necessarily imply slow rotation. Indeed, these planets are in so close that the nearest one orbits around the parent star in 1.5 days, and the most distant one with a known period orbits in only 12 days. The researchers also noticed that the ratios of neighbouring objects have periods which are very close to integer ratios. The first two bodies have a ratio of about 8 to 5, the second have a ratio of about 5 to 3. So these are called orbital resonances, and they're actually a good thing because with the right ratios, it will reduce the amount of chaos in the system and keep it stable for longer periods. This is important because the planets are so close together that their gravitational interactions are very strong. By modeling the interactions, the gravitational interactions, and looking at variations in the timings of the transits, the researchers were also able to put upper limits on the masses of all the bodies involved, and they are all roughly about one Earth mass or below. And combining that with the size of the planets that are determined by the amount of light they block, these all appear to be small, Earth-sized, rocky bodies. So should you pack your bags and head there? Well, I wouldn't go just yet unless you have a spaceship that can travel 12 parsecs. There's a lot of studying to be done. It's very unlikely that any of these will support life, but we don't actually know because we only have one good example of a planet with life on it. But it is worth noting that these M-type stars are so small and so low luminosity that they burn their fuel very slowly, and TRAPPIST-1 is expected to live for about 4 to 5 trillion years. That's 
500 times longer than our sun will ever live. In the distant dark future of the universe, these small red stars may be the last place where species live and thrive. But there's a long way to go before we have to worry about that. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.